So um, good afternoon. And first of all, I would like to start my talk by thanking the organizers for this possibility to present one of the projects I'm involved in in my PhD. I'm, in fact, a PhD student at the University of Heidelberg. And I'm working on this project uh, with my supervisor, Valeria, who is here today, and also with my collaborators, Robert Reischke and Björn Marte Schiffer. And again, this is a project about testing modified gravity theories. And again, it's about testing them with, with lensing. But I will focus specifically on ordicity gravity and with a kind of um, with, with lensing analysis, which is, I would say, not the standard one. And it's the 3D with lensing. But before I start, I'm sure that um, many of you will be wondering what this picture has to do with either 3D with lensing or ordicity theories. And the answer will come in a few slides. First of all, I would like to give you um, the message, so the main idea of this project, which is to say if and how well Euclid will be able to say something about parameters that describe or the theories of gravity. And doing this by using 3D cosmic shear analysis, which is a kind of analysis of with lensing data that keeps the information on redshift along the entire analysis. So do you see here there are two main components. One is or the theories of gravity, and the other one is 3D cosmic shear. So the rest of my talk will be about essentially explaining this true concept a bit more in detail, and then join them towards the end of the talk and present you some results. Quickly on or because we had many talks yesterday, um, just to fix my notation. So we start from the Lagrangian of the Ordesti theories. And we know that this depends on four functions of the extra scalar degree of freedom and, uh, and its kinetic term. And I highlighted them in red here. And once we specify these functions, we specify the model. And this is the most general class of theories with one extra scalar degree of freedom, uh, universal couple to matter, which allows us to, have, to be sure that we are um, free from also just instabilities because we don't have higher order derivatives in the equation of motion, uh, higher than second. And of course, this is a fairly general broad class of theories. So it's appealing from the point of view of the observations, because putting constraints on this class means constraining quite a few theories. Um, maybe one thing not all of you is uh, aware of is that uh, this class of theories was, of course, discovered by Ordesti in the 70s, went completely unnoticed for 40 years, and then was, was discovered recently. And in the meantime, Ordesti quit physics and started a very fruitful career as a painter. And you can go on Amazon and, and buy his paintings. He's still active. And um, so if you find them nice, you can buy them. And one of them is really the, the one that was at the beginning of my talk. OK. Now I would slightly move uh, towards the slowly move to the observational side. So um, the question arises in a more general way: what do, How do we distinguish between different models from uh, from the observational point of view? So we have data that tells us that we have to move to the level of perturbations. So we start from our perturbed metric in Newtonian gauge, where we define the uh, Bardeen potential phi and psi, and we define standard parameters like mu and eta as deviations from general relativity if they are different from one. Of course, then ideally, one would have to study the evolution of perturbations for each and every model. But this is very computationally expensive. So what people came up with is um, um, generic prescription, which is the, the effective field theory of dark energy, which is based on an expansion to quadratic order in the perturbations um, of the Lagrangian. And we are then left with nine operators, again, in red, which is which are a function of time, and uh, it's quite a lot of freedom. But if we, let's say, remain only at the level of ordinary theories, we can make a, a good choice for a clever choice for the basis of these operators, which is the Bellini-Savisky parameterization, which we heard a lot about yesterday, um, which boils down to only four functions of time and time only that describe fully the evolution of linear perturbations. And there are some features that are very nice about this parameterization. One is that um, they are completely perturbed level quantities, and they have nice physical um, interpretations, as you can see here. For example, alpha m is defined in terms of the effective Planck mass m star. So we will not spend too many details on this, because we, we heard a lot about this yesterday. But it's just to say that uh, uh, the target of this um, project is to make constraint, put constraints on the alpha functions. Um, 
uh, because of course there must be a relation then between alpha and the G functions in the Lagrange, Lagrangian so that if we one fits is the alpha then it fits is also the model of the la in, in the Lagrangian. Uh, what we aim at doing is putting constraints on the alpha functions by using weak lensing. So now I move to the to the lensing part very briefly again. So just to clarify that I'm speaking about cosmic shear effectively, so the weak lensing by the large scale structure, where the effect is so small that we have to measure it in, in a statistical way, and the statistics of the shear field reflects the statistics of the matter field. And a good way to um, start appreciating 3D cosmic shear is to realize that the shear, so the distortion, is actually a tensor and, and a spin two tensor, really. It can be described as a tensor. And th this fact comes from the, from the fact that it's invariant under rotation of pi, which makes sense, because if we start from a circular source, shear distorts it in, in, a, in a, an ellipsis, and an ellipsis gets mapped into itself under rotation of pi. So we can define the shear as a second edge derivative of the lensing potential, where the lensing potential is an integration of the Bardeen potentials along the line of sight. And the edge derivative is a differential operator acting on a Riemannian manifold, the sky. So the power of lensing is that it, people say uh, it can be used to, um, it, I mean, it is sensitive to the distribution of matter, to the growth of structure. And of, of course, it's, it's um, sensitive to the distance redshift relation. But in particular, the, the point of the growth of structure, which is crucial for the energy modified gravity, um, it's really something um, true if we consider the shear as a 3D variable. So if we, for example, were to consider a purely 2D analysis of lensing, we would, lose, we would lose a lot of information in redshift. So we wouldn't gain much information on a, a dynamical effect. So that's why in the early days of weak lensing, people came up with a, this idea of tomography, which consists in binning your sources in redshift beans, then calculating signal in these beans, and then calculating auto and cross correlations between the beans. Because in this way, the projection that you make is still there, but it's uh, smaller in range, because the bean range is, is of course, smaller. And, but you see here that this is an approximation. In fact, sometimes this, this approach is called 2D and a half in jargon because it loses still some kind of redshift information. So 3D, cosmic shear, is really an idea to analyze weak lensing data, re retaining the information we have on each source along the entire analysis. How do we build the formalism? So everything starts from expanding spin fields in 3D. In order to do that, we need to uh, choose coordinates and we choose uh, spherical coordinates. This makes sense because in, in in surveys, we typically the error is in the radial direction. We don't have much error in, in the angular direction comparatively. So, and then we also have to make a choice for the, for the basis of functions on which we expand our field. And a clever choice is to use for the radial direction the spherical Bessel function, and for the angular direction the spin two spherical harmonics, which are generalization of the spherical harmonics to the spin two case, in, so that we can replicate the properties of the shear field tensor. Um, and the reason why we choose this basis is because they constitute together an, a set of eigen basis, eigen functions for the Laplacian operator. So the relation between the coefficients of the, in, in this expansion of the shear field to, to the coefficients of the delta field, of the, the density field, is, more, is clearer in, in, in this approach. Of course, we don't actually measure gamma LM, but we have estimates for that. And this, of course, will depend on the distribution of our, sp of our sources in space and the error that we can make in assigning a redshift to each galaxy, which is modeled by uh, some, some probability distribution. So we have N of Z and P of Z. What we really care about is not the average of this field, because this would, would be zero again, but the, the covariance, different modes. And the point about covariance is that it can be split into a signal part and a noise part, where the noise part is essentially given by the fact that we are making a Poisson sampling of a smooth field, and so it's dominated by the variance in the intrinsic ellipticity in lensing, which is typically of order 0.3. <coughs> Instead, the signal part is a bit more complicated, and I would like to spend a few words this in interpreting this in a physical way. So 
first of all, you notice that um, there are many integrations on the spherical Besser functions. Even in, in the noise, there are actually integrations on Schultz Besser functions. So for th the first point I want to make is that these are things that are very complicated to calculate because these are highly oscillatory functions and standard methods fail. So what we had to come up with is a clever way of doing these calculations. And what we chose is the, the so-called Levin integration method, which unfortunately I don't have the time to discuss. But if you're interested, please ask me later about. And secondly, so um, you see that another computation from the point of view of computation is given by the fact that we have to compute off-diagonal elements. OK. so we, we, in the, this is due to, to the following fact that the homogeneity of the field is actually broken by at, at least three ingredients. One is the lens inefficiency. The other one is the error that we can make in, 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 in assigning redshift to our sources, and then the source distribution. And then finally, of course, these are the formulas for general modified gravity contexts, where the mu and the eta we can calculate from the alpha if we restrict to, to Hordesky. And everything, of course, boils down to the pow matter power spectrum. So we need to have a way to get the matter power spectrum in Hordesky context. And the way we choose is high class, so a modified version of the class Boltzmann solver code. Um, that has a very nice feature, which is that it takes as input the alpha functions. So it's very useful for our purposes. And one thing I want to, uh, to, not to notice is that we chose this parameterization of proportionality with omega dark energy for now for the alpha functions. And so we, we may want to, to vary this in the future. But this is the simplest approach as an initial phase. So before I, I show you some preliminary results, I would like to remind you that this is a forecast for Euclid. With, so I use Euclid specifications. And in particular, so for the source distribution, for the redshift probability distribution, and for the <coughs> fraction of sky covered. <coughs> um, and also, I would like to remind you the formula for the Fisher matrix, because where, where of course, the covariance matrices are included. So that's why we have to calculate them. So I would like, I selected a few results I have to make a couple of points. The first one I want to make is that uh, a comparison, essentially, between tomography and 3D width lensing. And the way I chose to describe this is by showing this curve, which is the, the signal to noise. But the signal to noise is the statistic that we define to have an idea of, of our sensitivity. And it's, um, so in this formula, you see there is a, a ratio between the signal and the, C, the full CL, so signal plus noise. And this, this formula is motivated by the fact that it's similar to the Fisher matrix expression. So if the signal to noise is high, the Fisher matrix will be big, so our errors will be small. And you see, using only a linear matter power spectrum, and of course the same states and same specifications, uh, 3D width lensing is more sensitive than tomography. We expect it to be more sensitive. But that's not the end of the story. The second point that I would like to make is that the treatment of nonlinearities is crucial. So this I'm plotting, here I'm plotting only 3D with lensing results using matter, linear matter power spectrum and non-linear pa matter power spectrum. And so you see the gain in information that we may have using a non-linear power spectrum. Of course, with the caveat that this is a modified gravity context, and what we're using here for the moment at, at least is um, a lambda CDM prescription. So we know that this, uh, this is not um, the way to do it properly, but there are not better recipes, that m much better recipes than that. Um, and also we account for bionic corrections for the use of EHM code. But this doesn't change much results, really. So maybe this point is even clearer looking at these constraints. Where I'm, so I'm putting, again, only 3D with lens in results. And you see the, how the uh, contours, one sigma contours, shrink using the, the non-linear matter power spectrum. OK, so to summarize, um, I show you how 3D with lensing can be used to say something about Hordesky theories. And also, I showed you how we expect it to be more sensitive than tomography. But this is really, this code for, uh, this is, I think it's a very really emergent case for the treatment of nonlinearities in modified gravity because we really need them to gain more information. And I would like to s stop here, thanking you very much for your attention.
A basic question, can you please say how you computed the nonlinear matter power spectrum in those forecasts? Yeah, so we use, okay, so we use um, essentially the halo fit prescription, which is um, already in high class, class and high class, and we correct also f with um, uh, the recipe from Mead et al. Tree, so the, with the HM code, to account for baryonic, uh, essentially, cor corrections. But this doesn't really change much for the scales that we consider. Did you use any prescription for screening, like <laughs> cutting down some small scales? Thank you very much for this question, because it allows me to speak something which I didn't, didn't have the time to speak before. And so we are starting to do this, yes, in a parameterized way, using some Gaussian, as much as you did in, in your paper, for example, in the, yeah, which makes sense. Although from the results we get at the moment, it seems, to, even if we marginalize them over the, the parameters involved, doesn't seem to have so much a big effect. 